This was the moment that Dimension 20 evolved. Something ominous is in fact creeping closer. She didn't make you feel good about yourself and you deserve to feel good all the time. I have to go. <gasps> oh my God. Oh my God. Dude. Oh my God. That was it. The simplicity of some guy in a moose hat creeping around backstage changed everything. He, or more accurately, Abrea Iyengar, is the reason Dimension 20 is in its golden era right now, with seasons like Mintopolis and Burrow's End. The skyrocketing production values, the experiments with projection and lighting, the new game systems, the props, the sets, even the hair, makeup, and the costumes. Except for Brennan, he still only has five shirts. I own lots of shirts! <laughs> All of these awesome upgrades, these wonderful additions that make Dimension 20 even more fun to watch than it already was are all due to Abria Iyengar. Yar. So how exactly did we get here? Let's take a brief look at Abria's career and how she came to be such an influential figure in the actual play space. Abria has had a fascinating career. She's run games for arguably the three biggest shows out there, Dimension 20, The Adventure Zone, and Critical Role. But she first started appearing in shows back in 2018, as far as I can tell. She first appeared on several series on Happy Jack's RPG Network. She ran and played on Saving Throw and eventually on Roll20 Presents, where she played in several of the official D&D &D modules. And while those shows definitely brought Abria into relevance, they don't really stand out to me in why she's so relevant now. I'm sure the shows are great and the people involved are lovely, but they aren't in service of the thesis of this video. Each of these shows largely follows what I call the critical role format, which has become the standard across the media. All the players on screen at the same time, either at the table or with their own webcams. It's usually live streamed, little to no post-production, maybe some music and some props, but it heavily relies on the charisma and chemistry of the players at the table. And just to be clear, there's nothing wrong with this format. Since this is the obvious way to present a tabletop role-playing game, as it's the way most of us play them. But at the same time, it isn't particularly visually interesting, and it was bound to evolve, especially in a medium that has grown as fast as actual plays have. I mean, look at early Critical Role, and look at Critical Role now. The show has grown a lot, but I would argue Critical Role is still behind the curve when it comes to the presentation of actual plays. And this brings us back to Abria's career. Pretty early on, Abria started getting involved with a lot of projects that were pushing the boundaries of what actual plays could be. So let's take a look at one of Abria's early actual plays from back in 2020, The Unleashed. The Unleashed is an actual play that Abria ran on Strawberry 17's channel that was one of, if not the first, experiment in the actual play format that at least I was aware of. First off, it looks great. Each player is color-coded from their background to their wardrobe without it being visually boring, and that just makes my brain happy. But that's not the actual challenge to the format here. This is the challenge. The Unleashed has regular scripted scenes within the actual play. We'll cut from the critical role format to a scene that is very traditionally scripted, performed, and edited. And I don't know about y'all, but I'd never seen anything like this before. This was a simple but bold experiment, but I don't think it worked. Without getting into the effectiveness of the scenes themselves, I think splicing in traditional cinematic storytelling with actual play storytelling is something of a conflict of interest. That's not the right term, but that's what we're going with for now. What I mean by that is that audiences expect something specific from actual plays, and that is at odds with traditional forms of storytelling. For example, when we go into a movie, we know that every moment and every word is carefully cultivated to produce a specific response from the audience. We know that the script has probably gone through several revisions, we know producers had notes, the actors added their flavor, and then editors made specific decisions about what takes to use. And that is a beautiful thing. There's a reason why movies and TV shows are the most popular form of art in the world. But actual plays are different. The stories are not carefully cultivated. They're unpredictable, spontaneous, and often really messy. Which, I think, is what people like about them. They like the chaos. They like the excitement of not really knowing what's going to happen. They like the suspense of knowing that a bad die roll is all that can stand between their favorite character and that character's end. And I think people enjoy watching the people create the story as it's being created, if that makes sense. It's exciting in a way that traditional media isn't. So when you splice these two styles together, it creates a jarring experience, or at least it did for me. We jump from the spontaneous excitement of an actual play to the specific and polished cinematic style. These are diametrically opposed mediums being spliced together and they just don't really mesh very well. I also think things got a little too literal. Most of what makes up an actual play takes place in the imagination. Use your imagination! So when you take what should be in the audience's imagination and put it on screen, you kind of take away from the authorship of the audience. They no longer get to invent their own version of the story in their head. This is a common thing when books are adapted into movies. The movies are rarely as good, or at least we don't perceive them to be, mostly because they're different from what we originally imagined. So how do you enhance 
enhance an actual play, make it visually interesting while maintaining what people like about it. Well, there's another example that Abria was involved in that maintains the spirit of actual plays while also just being visually insane. Kolok. Kolok is one of the weirdest actual plays I have ever seen. Not in terms of the system they use, the story, or the performers, but in the sheer number of artistic risks they take during the course of the show. It's still using the critical role format, everyone is sitting around the table playing a tabletop role playing game, but it's kind of visually insane. The set is incredible, the lighting changes based on the tone of the current scene, and they add visual effects to try and enhance the mood. Like this old school VHS type filter, or this. Frankly, I don't know how to describe that besides a bad trip. All of this really makes the series stand out, but not necessarily in a good way, because while I deeply appreciate all of the effort that went into the series and I admire the risks they took, I think they went a little too far. By the finale of the show, it looks like this. What am I even looking at? There is so much going on on screen that Frankly, I got a little overwhelmed. I think the visuals took center stage in this series. They're distracting in a way that doesn't really add anything to the story. And moreover, it doesn't fit the spirit of actual play shows. The great thing about actual plays is they're an art form we can easily create and perform at home with our friends. And that feeling, the story that we're creating, the time we're spending with our friends, that should be center stage, not cool visual effects or this. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not mocking or trying to devalue these shows. Failed experiments are extremely valuable, because when you learn what doesn't work, you get closer to what does. What we learned from The Unleashed is that actual plays need to lean into what makes them unique, not lean on more traditional forms of media and that we need to keep actual plays in the realms of the imagination. The audience doesn't need or want literal representations to tell us what's going on. And what we learned from Kolok is that the game, the story, the performers should be the focus, and any visuals, effects, or costumes should be there to support, not overshadow what the people came to see. So how do you make actual plays more visually interesting and engaging without subtracting from what makes them special? Enter Abria Iyengar on Dimension 20. Hello, friends, and welcome to Dimension 20. Uh, Hello! Yes. 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 I like this little hype moment. I am your highbrow oh. dungeon master. Oh. This is this was a lot, and I, I regret it. it. <laughs> <laughs> Yar. Abria's first appearance as a game master on Dimension 20 was Misfits and Magic. In my opinion, one of their best seasons. She appeared as a player in Pirates of Leviathan as well, but that's less significant to the topic at hand. As soon as Misfits and Magic started, Abria was bringing a new kind of energy to the dome. Her style was very different from Brennan's, being much more character focused than narrative focused. And another interesting change was the color of the dome, in that there was more than one. In every other season of Dimension 20, the dome was always just one color at a time. From the beginning, it would change color, mostly from blue to red to indicate a roleplay or battle episode, with a couple other colors mixed in to match the mood, but the opening scene of Misfits and Magic has this sort of pink and purple pattern, and it makes the dome feel much more alive. Some of the other changes she made include a new RPG system that is not D&D 5e. Shocker. She ran Kids on Brooms, a magic variant of Kids on Bikes, which honestly I think is a better fit for Dimension 20 than D&D, but that's a topic for another video. She also brought props into the dome, and not just any props, story significant props that grow as the characters do. Each player receives a wand in the beginning that is plain and boring, nothing interesting about it. But when they have a significant character moment, they receive a new moment, one that matches their personality and their aesthetic. This brought a fresh energy that elevated the show without distracting from anything. It was way more visually interesting, and every divergence from the D20 style enhanced and supported the story. And obviously they took note, because other D20 seasons started borrowing ideas. Most significantly, Shriek Week, Starstruck, and Coffin Run all used the different colored patterns in the dome. And then came the holiday special, which is even more of a significant step. The first shot has this gentle snowfall projected onto the dome. It made me briefly not hate snow. It sets this lovely seasonal mood to the show. And as far as I can tell, this is the first time Dimension 20 used projections. And a quick note on the history of projections in actual plays, technically Critical Role did use projections in their Campaign 3 premiere before Dimension 20, but they were also shot before their air dates, and D20 seasons are typically shot months before they air, so it's hard to say who came up with this idea first. But Abria was involved in Critical Role in Exandria Unlimited early earlier that year. I'm not trying to say that Abria was directly responsible for both of these huge shows coming up with the same concept in the same year. I'm just saying she seems to be the common denominator. But it doesn't really matter who came up with the first, because it's pretty clear that Abria brought this idea to Dimension 20. And it's one of the many things that she brought. So, 
a nice gentle snowfall. It adds some ambiance, it makes it feel like a real holiday special, but it kind of just stays there. It doesn't really do much except be there. And while I was watching that episode for the first time, I couldn't help but think there's a lot more potential to this idea. And then this happened. I have to go. <gasps> oh my fucking god. Oh my god. Dude. Oh my god. What? I just love this moment so much. I genuinely feel like it broke some boundaries in the best way. I mean, Luke kind of says it. This is supposed to live in the imagination. And I think the reason this works, whereas previous attempts like Riftside and Kolok didn't, is because of its simplicity. It's just an orange light and a guy in a creepy moose hat. It's much more theatrical, leads a lot more to the imagination, while also accentuating the moment. And then, Abria goes further and does this. <laughs> oh my god! I just love it. And Abria doesn't stop there. Her next outing as a GM was Court of Fae and Flowers, where she doubled down on a lot of the things that made Misfits and Magic so special. At the time, this was the most decorated the dome had ever been. It genuinely looks incredible. More detailed projections were used, there were more props, so many props, and it helped to serve the performance and the story. She already laid the foundation of this style, and here she's just building the house. And this style worked so well, that she completely and utterly changed Dimension 20 for the better. This year has been one of D20's best, and I think Abria deserves all the credit for it. Mintopolis, despite Abria's absence as both a player and a GM, has her style written all over it. Abria, let me know how I'm doing. <laughs> it even builds on her previous contributions, but in a way that serves this season's story. Brennan is running a noir version of Kids on Bikes. He's using props and projections, and even projects story-relevant art into the dome. And all of this led to Abria's magnum opus so far, Burroughs End. Burroughs End is so good, it makes me mad. Its story and performances are wonderful. Ah, my dick! <laughs> but the production level is fucking phenomenal. Abria brought full animation into the dome, the gnarliest, most visceral battle map I've ever seen, and an absolutely horrifying audio drama. <laughs> That's too fucking scary! <laughs> Abria Iyengar has forever changed Dimension 20, and by proxy has raised the bar for actual play shows. She found the perfect balance of high production value without sacrificing the spontaneity and excitement of the actual play medium. And I, for one, cannot wait to see what she does next. Yar!